gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Piavella, the president of the Italian Ophthalmological Society. We're honored to have him here as our chair. Dr. Piavella is also treasurer of the Italian Federation of Medical Scientific Societies, general secretary of the Italian Union, Association of Eye Doctors and Ortho Orthoptists, and president of the Together for Sight Foundation and medical director of CMA. Please put your hands together for Dr. Piavella. Thank you. Terry, thank you. I think that we, we, we can cut something, but anyway, I, it's my honor tonight uh, to present uh, this distinguished faculty that um, is uh, the key point of this uh, successful evening. First of all, my friend uh, Thomas Conan, professor and chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. Then uh, Dr. S uh, Cedric Schweitzer, consultant of ophthalmology at the University Hospital of Bordeaux, France. Then uh, Mr. Alan Basson, consultant refractive ophthalmologist in London, United Kingdom. And Professor Eva Ruka Kominek, the head of ophthalmologist in University Center of Ophthalmology and Oncology in Katowice, uh, Poland. Uh, Dr. Gonzalo Barnabeo is head of ophthalmology in uh, HM Valles Hospital in Madrid, Spain. And finally, uh, Professor uh, Michael Hammond, head of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Hospital St. John, Vienna, Austria. So uh, this is... Uh, the most important start, and uh, I would like to ask uh, to Thomas, please, uh, to, to start with a presentation uh, to Rai1 hydrophobic, because it is uh, the first topic of this evening. Matteo, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction, and that you let me start with a monofocal lens, yeah. which is, of course, very good, because many people <laughs> using monofocal lenses in the world and hydrophobic implantation, I think, uh, is a good step because we have hydrophilic materials and hydrophobic materials. And uh, a timeline of true IOL innovation uh, is pointed out here in the slide where we go back 1910. Rainer Keeler is founded in London, UK. It's important to know. That's a long history going back. Uh, 1949, world's first IOL is manufactured by Rainer. You all know, first implantation actually um, in, two th in actually this year. Although if we look through the books, we're not so sure if it was uh, February 1950. I was actually recently last year with David Spalton in London, and we looked through the books. It's very interesting to see. Uh, the original signings from Harold Ridley when he implanted the first lens. And I think he implanted the lens, but he took it out again. And the real lens, which stayed in place, was in February 2015. <coughs> and you all know this maybe, but uh, it's an interesting sign. 2016, Ray-1 full preloaded system is launched. 2017, Ray-1 trifocal is launched. I think it's very interesting that the company is moving in this direction. I'm a big fan of trifocal intraocular lenses. Uh, because I think that the bifocal area is over. We have trifocal lenses now available. And now in 2018, the Ray-1 Hydrophobic is launched, which gives the company, I think, a great opportunity to put every other optical system on another platform and another material. Uh, State-of-the-art manufacturing is the title of this slide. Uh, this is the company. I think that uh, the company has a high-quality standard. We're using the product of Rainer for many, many years in Frankfurt uh, at our department. Um, we were intrigued by the design of these lenses. We also use the add-on technology very often because this is a really good product, but I think that uh, speakers will talk about this a little bit later. Uh, the preloaded system, the preloaded platform, as you can see here, I think this is uh, important information. You have on the left side, you have actually the, uh, um, the monofocal systems, and the monofocal systems, of course, is going in, when you start in the middle, the spheric. As a premium IOLs, at least in our country, it's the aspheric technology, as you can see here. And then, of course, the toric version. And then the multifocal, which is now actually going in the trifocal direction. And I think that's actually a very good step to have this trifocality there. So that is the uh, uh, implantation we did on in May 24th. 
uh, the first global implantation post-CE market. Uh, it's in Frankfurt done. Uh, the team from Rainer came over. We did basically standard phaco emulsification technology, technique, and then we had this first implantation. And it's nice to see that was the first implantation. You had a very smooth delivery of this intraocular lens in the capsular bag. You can see that this has a special design. You can see these little notches here, which we can discuss later, but it gives better stability or, uh, or another options to stabilize an intraocular lens into the capsular bag. We're using here a temple approach. You see nicely this little sign that the lens is in the capsular bag. So from my perspective, very nice implantation, easy to do, and uh, very, very much into the standards of the current situation we have. Uh, here's the outcome. First ray, uh, one hydrophobic implantation. You see our patient uh, got a 19.5, 20.5 diopter lens, one month postoperatively. As we aim in most of these patients, slightly myopic, slightly myopic, uh, half a diopter here, and you can see in LOGMA visual acuity, which we now do very often, 2020 or 66 by the, by the nomenclature in Great Britain. The target was here a quarter of a diopter. We ended up a quarter of a diopter off this target by the first basically patient. I think that's very good, and the patient was very satisfied. Uh, I think use a couple of minutes or, uh, to talk about the implantation. I think you have here the ease to use or easy to use true two-step system, simply and intuitive. I can just tell you that uh, it has actually a minimal learning curve. We, we use this lens and this uh, system for the first time, uh, minimizes error because basically I think from my perspective is a very easy system to use of these uh, implantation system. Insert the I OVD is the first step is followed by locking the cartridge, as you can see here pointed out. Um, locking is, of course, intuitive as well. Uh, it's a single-handed plunger with minimal force required into this uh, technology. And then it's uh, important for us to see that we have an incision of 2.2 millimeter uh, sub-incision. Sub 2.2 uh, is the standard of care. We're also using or always using these kind of lens uh, incision sizes now for basically all our standard lenses. Unique lock and roll, because this technology allows the lens to come out, rolls the lens inside the injector for a single smooth movement, and I think that's also one step forward that we have this lens already uh, in the system here. Now there's a cornerstone taps, uh, new technology, as you can see here. Uh, stage one, the outer haptics begin to take up the compression force of post-operative capsular contraction, as you can see here on this slide. And if you have the outer haptics engaging the inner haptics, <coughs> as you can see here, and even further in stage three, the haptic tip gently meets the optic corners and are effective locked into the position. That means that we can use these lenses for different, different sizes of the capsular bag. Very interesting new concept, and you can see how this lens behaves or actually performs if the lens is in the capsular bag with some tighter contraction. Sometimes side contraction give you very good force in order, if you look further now, for trifocal lens or for toric lens because we need good stabilization into the uh, capsular bag. Um, it's ready to use. You see the lens here arrives ready to use. The IOM material uh, is not dependent on the temperature within the waiting room. Uh, this was also proven so far, flexible solution in cases of last-minute IOL changes. At, I think it was a smooth unfolding process. You saw it in the video, similar unfolding characters like the hydrophilic lens, which is important. <laughs> For many of you might, uh, of course, are familiar with the material from Rayner, traditionally used hydrophilic material, and you have a full power range uh, and a 6 millimeter full optic from minus 10 to 30.2 diopters. I think this is a very smart move because if you go into the myopic range, then you really can cover the whole range. Many companies unfortunately have stops by 10, by 6, by 0, but if you're also in the minus range, I think that's very easy for the surgeon because then you really can cover the whole range 
and 32 diopters is also nice. Maybe you can go, go even a little bit higher. Some patients have 33, 34, 35 because they have for high hyperopes, but I think that of course is doable in the future. Ultra smooth, uh, as we pointed out here. We have an independent study results from the REACH Institute in uh, Heidelberg. My colleague uh, Gerd Aufrath is running this department and they uh, have shown here the outcome uh, in terms of uh, the uh, comparison with other competitors of the hydrophobic event, and they found absolutely equivalent or even superior uh, in terms of the microvacuoles, which is one of their studies. They looked at the microvacuoles for the scoring system, the score below one of the clinical Mayata scale. You know that the research is going into the scaling system uh, will not produce any significant visible glistlings on the slit length examination. So what they did is slit length examination and is therefore considered glistening free. And you see here the materials actually on this side, very good marks. That's the Acrosurf IQ. That's the Technis, the Vivinex, Lucia from uh, Zeiss. So I think uh, Rainer can be proud with the outcome of this study. Um, you can see here the outcomes, actually, uh, although you can see here the comparison of the current uh, Acrosoft material. Uh, Rainer, all, uh, of course, knows that also this company is producing or will actually develop a new material, but it's very important with the hydrophobic because that was really the problem with these lens types, that you have glistening-free uh, outcomes. It uh, shows here the uh, appears dark with average result of 1.96, Whereas with the current situation, we have a, a much higher rating on this Miata scale. In summary, I think this new material, this new lens, uh, patient outcome, usability, of course, is important. Ultra glistening free, aspheric aberration neutral design, important for us. It, it's uh, belonging, therefore, to the premium IOL sector, designed to minimize PCO due to the Ammon Apple 360 enhanced square edge. Michael Ammon put his Fingers here on again, very good. Unique counterstone shape with anti-vaulting haptic for stability for the nozzle into the eye. I just showed you this during the preparation of the video or while implantation. And of course, it's a preparatory hydrophilic material with no warming or weighting needed when you implant this lens. Nicely 2.2 millimeter incision uh, via this 1.65 millimeter injection nozzle and a full preloaded true two-step injector system with patented, I think that's good, lock and roll technology. So a new IOL, which really has a lot of promise for uh, becoming a very good uh, intraocular lens for this monofocal situation. Uh, and of course, the full range of powers, as I just pointed out, from minus 5 to 30.2 diopters. Here's uh, the last slide, the first Rainer hydrophobic implantation. Proud to present this picture from Frankfurt. Unfortunately, you can only see our OR and not a nice view like in Vienna, but our view in Frankfurt is not so nice like in Vienna, I have to say. And here are the references which belong to this. With this, thank you very much. Thomas, thank you. Well, uh, to, to brief comment about uh, the implantation. You know that um, many, many colleagues think that the injector system is a, a little bit weak point because it doesn't work perfectly in 100% of the cases. Rotate the lens, stitch the optic. Did, uh, did, did you have a, uh, only good experience with uh, this material because hydrophobic naturally is a little less uh, flexible uh, then? And uh, what is uh, your opinion about uh, the new shapes of the optic that naturally allow to, to match uh, this material? in the proper way for the implantation and stability in the back? After my first implantation, we had the opportunity to, to implant actually 10 more lenses and yeah. five patients. Uh, very easy process. We had no complications in doing this. So very intuitive process, mm -hmm. I think, because this was first done. I'm even, I was too busy. I even didn't try anything in the lab before. I just went yeah, dry yes. into surgery, but it went very well. So that's a, it's a good sign. In terms of the shape of the optics. I think that's a very interesting mm -hmm. design. Um, I'm not sure how you place it in the future. If you really can do some kind of, I, I'm just thinking about optic capture because you have this mm -hmm. little counter notches. If you have a femtosecond laser technology and you have a right, the right 
capsulectomy size or capsulotomy size, this might be even a possibility to do that. And maybe if you think a little bit further, sometimes we are looking, we are looking for options when uh, premium IOLs are implanted in capsular bags where the posterior capsule is ruptured. And maybe that's an opportunity for the company to have this because it's really missing in many companies that we don't have an option for patients with capsule rupture. So it might be a great opportunity. Mm. Everything else I cannot tell you at the moment. The lens was sitting in the capsular bag and I found this to be a good thing. But I, I think that requires further research in the future. But I think it's a good idea to have this kind of uh, shape which you saw on the optic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.